which was hosted by ISPI. Um, and when I was in that meeting, I was wondering, as we had a large audience of learning and development professionals, we may have had some other types of practitioners as well, but I, I had a concern. My concern was what was driving or feeding into the learning and development interventions that, that were, were being proposed at either companies you work for or clients that you provide service and support to. And my concern was that if you did not have a seat at the executive table, driving the strategic goals of the organization amidst what's happening with COVID and the pandemic, where we now see that all of the ecosystems inside of operations is merging. But because of that concern, I saw the writing on the wall where the learning and development profession was uh, destined not to do too well going into the future. And from that, um, we decided that there would, it would be a value to have a presentation relative to what is the impact of technology on companies and organizations amidst COVID-19? Uh, what is the C-suite saying they need in order to plan for the future? And what do learning and development practitioners need in their toolkit as part of their resources to be effect effective and integral parts in serving their companies they work for or the clients that they provide services to. And so I have a, a short PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to bring up. Oh, I, the imperatives of learning and development. I want you to know that our team, we, we do a lot of research specific to learning and development. And it wasn't too long ago that we realized through our research that any previous work regarding L&D, um, those roadmaps were no longer viable because of COVID-19. It, it, it's really just pushed it over the edge. We also knew that there was gonna be a huge amount of jobs that would be eliminated now, when we talk about the number of jobs that are being eliminated, I can't take the time to go over all of it, but you all will see through a couple of slides I have coming up, a number of roles have been eliminated. And many of these roles impact the last wave of baby boomers that are in the workforce, which means that generation X and Y and millennials will be the lion's share of workers left in the workforce. And so there's a transparency also required in terms of work working within this new generational workforce. There's a lot being said about how we encourage organizations to be transformative and the role of learning, how that's so important as well. And you may see some references. We like to reference those that have provided the feedback that I'm sharing with you. And when we talk about the speed in which the work culture is, is, is transforming, and it really it calls for this, the key word is abrupt change. And we use technology. You'll see in just a moment that we know that artificial intelligence and other intuitive resources have now permeated the workforce and even more so at light speed because of COVID-19. And there's a need now for organizations, just not because of trend as it was prior to the pandemic, because of necessity now, they need to integrate this advanced technology into the workforce. And so you'll see how we'll talk to the highly skilled workforce, the highly skilled roles in the workforce, which we believe will be the remaining roles because everything else will be automated with algorithms through AI and machine learning, et cetera. We will share with you something about course content and creation on mental acuity that we believe all individuals in the workforce will need to develop certain soft skills, not necessarily hard skills. Machine learning and deep learning and algorithms, they will embrace a lot of the functionality that many hard skills used to maneuver through operations and within organizational development. But more importantly, humans now 
we'll need to be more human. When I say more human, we need to do things with our brain that robots can't do, that algorithms cannot program. And so there's a lot of theory that binds us together, but I wanna make sure there's clarity and reassurance in regards to what is unpredictable because many of us right now are suffering through some anxiety because of the transition that's required. And so with this change, there's a lot of changes in management practice as well. And this is where one of my colleagues will share some very strategic organizational performance acceleration components that we believe if you harness, if you haven't already, you'll be able to achieve not only a seat at the executive table, but a viable value contribution to the organization that you work for or those clients you represent. Nice saying here in terms of the future. Now, I'll get past the references slide and just jump right into a preamble to sharing some things that I think will be of value to all of those that are listening and those that will listen to the recording. And I will say this much, we will afterwards provide a way for you to reach out to the Institute so that you can have additional information uh, and what I would call a more feature rich discussion regarding what might help you in your practice. The future of work, impacts of COVID-19. And you know, COVID-19, the pandemic is now accelerating across our country. This is going to cause great stress on organizations. In fact, as I've looked at the research we've done in companies that are currently downsizing, I won't go over all of these, but it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It, you know, Lionsgate and Star Z just announced layoffs and furloughs on October 5th to all of their employees working from home. Can you imagine? You're working at home on Zoom and you're going to get an email. The Gap stores closed 350 stores. Boeing lost $400 million last the third quarter in the last quarter. The list goes on. And because of this, we also see a number of organizations filing bankruptcy. And I, I want to mention right now some additional research we've done is in executive recruiting. I have a list here of the top 200 executive recruiting firms, Hydrogen Struggles, Corn Ferry, so forth and so on. Th they are going to be seriously impacted by how recruiting takes place in the future. We don't have time today, but HR, human resources departments are going to have a serious impact in terms of the impact of AI and other intuitive, intelligent technologies and how they used to do business versus today. And I think I heard last time we had a chance to meet during the last meeting that some direction may be coming out of HR. Unless HR is tethered to the executive team, that is not the resource that will drive your L&D agendas in the future. Here's some companies that are in danger of going bankrupt and some companies offering early retirement. I'll breeze through this, but Delta Airlines offered early retirement to 17,000 employees. That's one fourth of their workforce. Who did it go to? People born what? 1946 to 64, baby boomers. That group, if you're in the last wave, say born 57 to 64, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a lot of fear. Am I gonna have a job? Number two, if I'm a consultant or a practitioner, Am I gonna have clients that are going to wanna to listen to what I have to say? That's what really today is all about. We wanna make sure that we equip you. The impact of learning and development, whether it's performance improvement, organizational effectiveness, OD, and all the service and support, that's what's at risk. So if we're not empowering practitioners to effectively prepare to not only prepare themselves, but highly skilled workers within groups that they work for and support, with all this advancing technology, that's where there's a dim light. So we, we really feel that the L&D practitioner groups need to ask, not, not only start the conversation with the executives and have the discussion, but also be able to provide the skills and resources required to help move that needle forward. I'll just move on from here, but here are companies that are acquiring other companies. What does that say? That says they, they have moved beyond what used to be their core 
products and services to what are now the new products and services and also the new go-to-market strategies that are required to continue to generate revenue. This fourth industrial revolution that I talked about, this is just information that I think you need to understand in terms of what is going to be happening regarding virtual reality. This chart shows about 2.5 million workers per year being displaced from 1900 to 1940, about 1 1.2, they were displaced because of the agriculture and that industry and what happened. Going forward, about 0.8 million here because of manufacturing during 1970 to 90, 0.6 from 06 to 2010. But look at this number, 2.5 million, the great transformation going yeah. forward. This is extremely, extremely imperative to understand what is happening. And so we now want to look at how many of those jobs will be uh, re replanted back into the future workforce because there is a percentage of those that will. It's estimated the reabsorption was 0.07. What is the reabsorption? If they don't have the right skills, there'll be no reabsorption. Zero. Those unemployment numbers you see will continue to rise. And this is from Bain and Company out of Boston. Let me just go forward and talk about, you know, McKinsey has, you know, its predictions as well. I won't read this, but we like to refer to some of those who have done extensive research. If we look at what Van Dyke is saying here about automation and software and so forth, robotics, personal robotics, all of these are major components and the analytics, data analytics that is required as well. And we know, we know that there are many organizations right now that are going through and looking at how do they apply some of the technology. Artificial intelligence in terms of drug discovery, not only repurposing, design, synthesizing information, running preclinical experiments. Just take a guess at the role AI is playing in creating the vaccine for COVID-19. Think about it, think about it. And so Qualtrics listed some components as well in terms of advanced data analytics and automation. And I wanna just stop here and say, you know, so what, why are we here? What is the Institute, what are we providing to assist with proficiency for highly skilled roles? I want you to think about this as practitioners for the clients that you have, the customers that you have, or if you're in an organization chartered with moving and accelerating performance improvement. And I, I'm a big, I don't, I don't wanna say big, but huge believer in performance improvement and the fundamentals of performance improvement and the human performance technology model generated by Van Teen, Dessinger and Mosley. In fact, in my dissertation, Dr. Darlene Van Teen was uh, my chair at one point. And so I know these individuals, Brethau, I know Roger Addison, I know these luminaries in the film, and I just, and, and Bernardes, et cetera. This work is not only submitted in the academics, but has been used in working environments where we have had an opportunity to work with companies, a number of small and medium-sized businesses companies, and given them these these services and support recommendations. And so I wanna share them with you today in terms of what are we providing? And I'll just show you a couple of quick slides and then I'm gonna turn it over to Erica. Artificial intelligence, cognitive performance dynamics. We're not promoting anything, I want you to know that. We're not, we're not marketing anything, but a while back I, I wrote a book on the workforce of the future. And then I had to think about it really carefully and wrote another book regarding cognitive performance dynamics. And this is a theory, and it, it's a theory that's based on behavioral sciences. And I want you to know that uh, from a behavioral sciences standpoint, we really are looking at experimental psychology, but moving that needle along quite so. Workers need to enhance their behavioral skills in what we call a technocentric environment. And the key is, how do they do that? How do, and what skills? 
And we're not just talking about any skills. We're not just talking about Lominger's 67 core competency skills that really refer to a working trend that has gone by. It's been eclipsed. We are now in the fourth industrial revolution. And I wanna tell you right now, we're not gonna stay in the fourth industrial revolution. We're gonna move beyond that into a tech bioengineering evolution, which is gonna be a continuum focused on the earth and atmospheric phenomena and space and planetary exploration. And so these core competencies that you see here are intuitive in nature, cognition, they involve neuroplasticity and they involve critical thinking. And to uh, review what I would call some of the cornerstone components of that, uh, and briefly, I, I don't think we have enough time to really go into it in great detail, uh, but we believe that these are viable components and we define them as mental acuity. And there are specifically nine of these mental acuity components that we believe your constituency should be paying very close attention to and developing. And to help us do that, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Erica Heilman. Um, if Erica has ability to share screen and share with you AICPD. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for that introduction. And I'm going to share my screen. Hold on one second. Just going to stop your screen, Dr. Roberts. Yeah. Let me pull it up. Here we go. Okay, so I am giving you all a little inside <laughs> look. So uh, this is pretty much what I see the admin side of the course that we created in Learn Dash that houses all the AICPD course content. And so I do just want to give you a preview of kind of what this looks like in terms of how we're organi organizing the content and uh, how we think this should be broken down and accessed by different groups of people in the workforce. So we have three versions. One that I have open right now is the practitioner version. We also designed an enterprise version and a student version. And that was so that we could uh, assign different types or different levels of tools and resources based on the role. And so I chose to show you the practitioner view because most of you listening will be practitioners. Um, and I can, I, as a practitioner, a lot of the mindset in designing the flow of this was from previous certification experience or previous coursework. And the intent was to make this as accessible as possible. And um, a lot of the other background that went into the structure was around making sure that the information is not only accessible, but uh, applies to different types of learning styles, all within the early access versions of um, Bloom's taxonomy. So we're really not asking people to evaluate or critically analyze this content but just wanting to present it to them so that they can begin to understand what we're talking about when we say the future of work and what we mean by cognitive performance dynamics and what it means to be adaptive in a highly technocentric work environment. So as you can see, there are those three mental acuity lessons. And so if I, just so you can see that back end, if I go ahead and do view, so you can see that the course is breaking down, broken down to those three mental acuities. And so if we take a dive into the first one, we can see that the learning objectives for this is so that participants are able to identify characteristics of personal development in the future of work. So how did it used to look? What was the old narrative that no longer is going to serve us in the future? And what is the new narrative that we're working to develop? And how can we create space so that that new narrative can emerge? The second, recognize factors of adaptive learning in the context of work. So that's the contextual factors of adaptive learning and identify factors of resilience specific to the digital world. 
So this is just giving you a glimpse at the first one and the topic, basically you can see I've already completed one of them um, just because I've gone through them. But if you click on the topics, basically it takes you through all the content that the research team pulled together and positioned in terms of what did it use look like and where are we headed. And then each section also has a quiz. And so the quizzes will, again, take you through those early stages of Bloom's taxonomy, not going too deep. So this will be to assess for understanding. And as a participant or as people go through this content, we're really looking to see how they absorbed the material. Is it, or do they understand that there are changes happening every day and that part of it is and this is something you said, Dr. Roberts, that has always stuck with me is that we need to dehack the brain. We need to dehack our minds from habitual responses, making sure that we're no longer operating in the workforce on autopilot, but instead being able to be intentional with, am I, am I acting out of habit or is this the scenario in which I need to apply greater adaptive capacity? And so as the you can see it goes through to mental acuity lessons three, there are two and three, there's a final capstone quiz. And then at the end, once you've completed all of the lessons in the capstone quiz, we have the tools and utilities folder, which I just wanna pull up for you. So you can see that we had spent uh, a long time, a lot of, uh, People have come together to make these tools and utilities really rich. And they basically, let me try to talk as I go through. So hold on one second. The materials, tools, and resources. Yeah. So as you can see, they include the course modules that I went through briefly, showing you more detail the first one. Um, there's a curriculum facilitator's guide, the capabilities matrix, as Dr. Roberts outlined, the architecture matrix, performance management and man management system tracker. And then this is downloadable as a zip file. So it's important to us that people have access to these tools and are able to learn alongside of them so that they can be used in application and in the workforce so that they're used in the context of the work. Yeah. And so that is the course. I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, but I do just want to share that the, you know, once participants have received a certification or once going through this type of course, they can continue to leverage the core competencies based on their job skills and the requirements and look at the results year after year or even quarter after quarter to see how yeah. learning these competencies and practicing these have improved improved performance over time, we think dramatically. And so it's a great offering to clients to be able to meet them collaboratively in the space where we're asking them to show up collaboratively. That's part of being able to be adaptive ourselves and be able to learn amongst uncertainty. And then as we're asking and helping our clients do the same. Excellent. And I want to thank you Erica, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and so I, I want you to understand that for those practitioners that are listening, this is an enclave for you to have the discussion within your organization or company you work for the organizational development and performance improvement side in terms of what are we doing? What are we doing to excite and enhance the core skill capabilities components of employees that have to be now working with this type of technology? If the answer is, I don't know, this is a golden opportunity to bring these tools forward and say, guess what? I've got a suggestion. And so that's the purpose of why we wanted to share what we shared. Uh, we will now move uh, forward and I will continue with uh, the slide presentation uh, at this, uh, next section here uh, so that we can um, uh, have a uh, uh, further discussion. Uh, let me 
I think I got it myself. Here at the beginning, yeah. On the end show in come back. Yeah. Uh, to this one here and see if that will, don't know why it won't. Um, let me just pick up from there. Um, hmm. Bear with me. I'm going to try to just race ahead. And I'm sorry that I uh, wasn't able to make Sorry, that. we all struggle with this damn technologies once in a while. <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, we may change it from time to time. <laughs> I'm sure it's something on my, you know, I just didn't know how to do it correctly. Okay, so. Um, Th there is a knowledge transfer piece with what Erica shared with you. And um, so know that as well. But let's talk about the impact of digital transformation. And this kind of goes back to uh, data science from before. Digital transformation is really impacting strategic planning and performance. And it, it's happening across all organizations right now. Here's a little bit from Gardner about what's going on. You know, AI is now driving so many different components, blockchain and other uh, space components uh, within continuous improvement. Accenture uh, talked about this vision, uh, uh, which was dated somewhat, but within the last few years, where digital technology is really going to become the advantage. And this is where I talked to you before about um, ecosystems are now collapsing. Um, we, we know about what many futurists are saying, and it's pervasive. It's pervasive. There's so much information on it. I, we've got treasure droves of it, but we're, we're cherry picking those components to let you know it impacts every industry sector. Uh, we focus on small and medium sized business, but it's also impacting larger organizations. What Sackett is talking about, about and all of that, the automation of repetitive tasks, and that is why the not the highly skilled roles, but the other roles that have been uh, rote and routine, they're going to be eliminated and they are being eliminated. Many of the jobs that employers have furloughed uh, are not coming back. And, and management teams are having to rethink what is their viable contribution uh, because now the salaried and executive positions and man management positions are being looked at as well. And that's the crux of what we're gonna show you. We talked to a number of second in command COOs and, and sometimes CEOs, but mostly those chief operating officers that are wrestling with what am I going to do to keep us in business? What do I need to change in order to stay vibrant? And this is going to create new processes that force people to adapt. And we're going to show you some of what that is because AI is now transcending what I call transformational divides. It's collapsing ecosystems and it's taking a look forward at where we need to go, how we need to plan, not only in 2021, but 2022, 23, 24, and how does all that rotate in some type of an ecosystem that produces continuous improvement. And that's part of what you'll see uh, relative to the impact of digital transformation. And, once again, here, um, making sure that if I went through through that too fast, I apologize, but hopefully you heard what I had to say, which was more important. What is the Institute providing for those with operational consulting and, and learning to raise strategic performance? Um, just a few slides regarding strategic organizational performance acceleration. And then I'm gonna have George share some of those tools and utilities, once again, that we believe as practitioners, are you driving that conversation with the C-suite that you're talking to? You must be talking to the C-suite. It's an imperative. That's your pivot. I, I want you to know it's called a strategically defined adjustment pivot, an SDAP. You must do that in order to survive. Otherwise you will be looking at retirement because there won't be anything to do relative to the core of what your expertise and discipline lies in, okay? And so we wanna talk about vibrancy and this is how you talk to these groups. This is the role of the individuals right now that are asking, uh, being asked questions by either founders or CEOs of what have you done for me lately to make sure we're gonna be around? 
I don't want to be on that list of bankruptcy. I don't want to be acquired. And so these roles now that you see, they're the roles that are now bubbling up. You can see them. You know, transformational officer, chief strategic innovation officer. These are the roles. And so people sitting in second in command seats now are having to almost reach, rethink about what is my job? What is my value to the organization? We know that through the SOPA certification, there are a number of tools we'll share with you. Well, George will share with you in just a moment, but there are some outcomes here. One, what is the financial impact from COVID? What is the financial impact amidst all the operational changes? What is this going to do? If you're for-profit, you're looking at EBITDA. If you're not for-profit, you're looking at proficiency relative to your financial statement. How do you drive operational excellence? We have a process called ODCM, Organizational Development Change Management. For those of you who are change managers, this is perfect for you. This is a new tool that you can now knock on the door of your upline supervisor, executive, or your client and say, I got something I think can, can help. Measuring goal attainment. And then here are three more, and I'll turn it over to George. The adaptive culture, all of us, all of us are having to adapt. The key word is resilience. How resilient are we to get through this pandemic, to be viable, and to still have a customer base where we're not only competitive, but we're profitable. And then departmental road mapping is key and performance management. So to go through that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing screen and George McCurchin. George, why don't you go ahead now and share what you have? All right, thank you. So uh, I will try to share my screen right now. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yeah. just fine. All right, perfect. So oh, your screen's coming up. Perfect. All right. Let's see here. Oopsie. Can I give you guys a brief preview, but I'll try to get go through this kind of quickly. Um, I'm gonna move this out of the way so that way I can see what I'm doing. All right, so all right, perfect. So all right, so I don't want to scare you as much as Dr. Roberts has already, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of some hard truths here. Um, and I want you guys to think about this as you go along this uh, presentation, at least what I'm gonna say. Um, and these are some of the things that we that we think that are happening right now. So the first truth is your strategic plan pretty much went out the window when COVID happened. The old strategic playbooks, they don't apply anymore. And then um, Archie Deskus uh, from, or the senior vice president uh, and the chief intelligence officer uh, from Intel Corp uh, said that transformation requires massive shifts in culture, operations and people. Uh, with change and culture being the toughest aspect. And I want you guys to kind of like keep this in the back of your heads um, as, as I go along. Uh, and if you have any, any more that you, any hard shoots, maybe later we can talk about that. But I wanted to get into the strategic tools that we have created. Uh, these are the strategic tools that are the toolkits we believe every practitioner should have on them. Uh, these are ex executable items and methodological supportive items. I'll go through them. That's a lot. We did. A, there's a lot of L&D that comes goes into this, and that we did. Um, we're very proud of them, and it's uh, tried and tested. So now I'll start with the performance acceleration ecosystem. Uh, this is probably the big picture. What I can give you, and as I can go along. Uh, we'll start out with the strategic goals. Of all the strategic goals listed in the existing strategic plan, uh, each of them have associated tactics and ac actions uh, to accomplish each goal. The top seven to nine uh, are placed on the strategic prioritization grid uh, to be provided by the executive leadership, uh, ex uh, the executive leadership team. And this is where, this is around this, this process right here. So we created a tool for that, which is the strategic prioritization planning grid very simple enough, uh, but it gives you this here. So the prioritization lists 
the goals and the tactics. The tactics are weighed one through five, with one being uh, the most critic, uh, urgent and imperative, and number five being and number five being very important, uh, but not urgent. So you can do these as you go along. Um, the executive team then selects top six to eight tactics. Uh, we recommend six, but no more than eight, uh, to spread across the seven, seven through nine goals, requiring solutions and formulates an associated problem statement. The executive team then determines which department are the key stakeholders and influence the performance gap. So I have a little bit of an example here. I know this is probably a lot to intake, but so here when we look at this, so let's just say one of our goals is to increase revenue by 20%. Um, and one of our tactics is to decrease uh, IT issues or the tickets that comes along. Each uh, executive assigns this tactic as a priority level one through five, and then an aggregate is generated. Uh, the lower the number, the higher the priority. So when we look at this, when it's in red, we see that John Doe, the committee chair, who is the one accountable for it, is this is an urgent task that needs to be done now. Um, as and as it goes higher in number, we'll see that it's not as significant and could be less important. So let's go back to the the, the performance acceleration ecosystem. So we pretty much got through uh, this process here, and, and I'm going to skip a few of these and go all the way down to the ODCM, the uh, Organizational Development Change Management. Uh, process here. So we prioritize the goals and the tactics. Pretty much now what? Uh, well, we're going to go through the ecosystem. And now that we come to the ODCM process, uh, this is a deep dive gap root cause and solution generation activity. This is a two day activity where we want to generate actionable items. And the actionable items will be generated with the executive team all together so that each department's voice is heard. And we want to make sure that each, each voice is heard uh, because we, we don't want anyone to feel left out or anyone to say, well, our voice was not heard in this situation. And this is Dr. Roberts. Uh, this is what we, we the ODCM process, actually, us actually doing it. We can see Dr. Roberts there in the background hiding from everybody else. Um, yeah. From there, we go to the uh, key performance objectives or the KPO log, as we, we called it. Once we prioritize the goals and tactics, we generated, and then we generate the actionable items, our next steps is to identify key performance objectives. We draft them and then assign them to individuals and uh, departments. So the KPO log is a tool that allows you not only to see the individual performance, but how well the departments are achieving the, to their assigned departmental goals and the enterprise score all together. So this is a very dynamic and a, a very customizable tool that lets you see what everyone is doing or able to do. Um, and I'm not going to go into too deep, uh, too deep into this because I know I have a, a only a short amount of time left. Um, but I'll just move on. So now, finally, we go to the balance scorecard where we're going to connect all the dots together. All right. So this one is a very uh, great useful like slide. I think it, it connects every single um, every single uh, section together with, with each one and why and why they're so important. The balance scorecard is a solution generated via the ODCM and they're added together to this balance scorecard and they're denoted as enables enablers drivers uh, to address relevant strategic objectives in all four of the quadrants. Now if we had more time I would go into a little bit more deeper detail in it, but this is kind of what it looks like. It's very simple. Uh, all the information can just be put in, put into this, and you can uh, you can actually uh, relate that back to your previous uh, previous ones. So with that all said, um, I hope I was very clear, and uh, try to keep it right on time. Um, but this is our contact. If you guys need anything from us, or if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and then, well, thank you. And I'll leave Dr. Roberts to continue from here. Thank you very much, George. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to both my colleagues, uh, Dr. Erica Heilman and George McCurchin, for sharing those tools, because this is where I wanted to kind of drop off. And then, Vince, we can open up for any questions. What yeah. if 
for the SOPA certification, what if, what if you as a practitioner, you drove this discussion at your company? Or if you have, if you're a practitioner, you got clients, you knocked on the CEO's door and you said, I got something you need to listen to. This is, these are times uncertain. And I want to talk about how you can stay in the game through a process that closes all your performance gaps, but addresses your strategic objectives. And you take them through this. And you just saw a piece of it. But if you took them through it, guess what? You now have solutions on performance gaps that address where they need to go amidst the pandemic and beyond. Now that you got the solutions, guess what? L&D professionals. That's how you generate your learning and development interventions. You don't get them from HR. Exactly. You are the driver. And you are now manifesting a future relationship that will go on for, I don't know how long, until you're ready to retire, I guess. That's what we wanted to do today. We wanted to share. We wanted to give you the glimpse. Some of you may say, I'm already doing it. Great. I'm so happy to hear it. For those of you that aren't, it's available. We want to make sure that you know it's available. Yep. Those are our recommendations. We're open to talk to anyone who's interested in learning more. Vince uh, Miller, thank you so much. Um, officially, we're we're done with the professional yep. presentation. We're still. Um, uh, we have some feedback uh, for the three of you. If you would stay on, and we'll end it by one o'clock sharp. Uh, several items were posted in chat which might be of interest to you also. And other people are still posting things. For starters, uh, Miller, would you like to refer to an item you recently posted in chat so everyone knows about it? Yes, thank you, Vince. Uh, this is a World Economic Forum uh, paper that uh, Dr. Roberts provided us. Um, you can uh, click on it and download it. And I think you'll find it very interesting reading. It's really impressive as to what companies around the world are doing during uh, this pandemic and how they are positioning themselves for the future. And it's, it's right in sync with what Dr. Roberts and his colleagues have been telling us today. I think you'll find it very interesting. Thank you, Miller. Um, some of the, there were various questions in chat, which I'll refer to some of them. Since we have some time, Kathleen, you asked a very provocative question. Would you like to explain this to everyone? <laughs> well, I hope I remember what it is. Um, I, I guess one of the things is I'd love for you guys just to give your top tip on uh, for practitioners going in and really understanding what's going on in their industry or their business and uh, translating into that what it means to L&D, right? Because the, the, the C-suite, they're gonna put strategic goals for their company. They're not gonna translate them necessarily into the L&D or performance language. And I'm not gonna go knock on their door until I am very well equipped, right? So what would be your top tip in terms of really understanding the new impacts on your industry and on your business? Because whatever happened was happening six months ago ain't happening now, right? So I think, and you guys have explained that really well. But if, if you just had to boil it down into a top tip or two, what would you say? So I'll take that question. And I, I want to talk about what you said about you, you didn't feel comfortable knocking on their door and sharing maybe what uh, some of the tools and components uh, George expressed. And I'm going to say you need to find who is comfortable I know, I, th I think you're mischaracterizing my question. Uh, okay. I am not uncomfortable talking to leadership. I wanna make sure on behalf of practitioners that what we're doing is going in armed ourselves, right? Um, before we go knock on their door, right? Because you okay. get this much time with, with C-level people, right? Okay, well then I would say it comes down to research. Um, it, no matter what the industry is, the information is out there on the World Wide Web, you know, regarding the impact of COVID-19, the pandemic, what's going on now, the economy, even pre-pandemic, through what we are going through now and projections into the future. Uh, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Doing the research, not only looking at current state, but what needs to happen in the future for someone uh, to be viable, to be competitive, and to offer services, products and services that the market sector uh, would be more than happy uh, to endorse and consume. I think that's number one. The secondary question behind that is, what are you doing 
Mr. or Mrs. Customer, or whoever it may be, executive, what are you doing to assure that you're in the game? And then that, there's a hush point. Whatever they're saying, I can guarantee you, if it doesn't incorporate some of the strategic planning prioritization components that we just talked about, it's gonna be off the mark. And so really it's a value proposition discussion, um, Kathleen, if anything else. That's great. Thank you. I, just, I do wanna add one point too that um, I think is in addition to everything that you said, Dr. Roberts, it's important for practitioners to be able to speak confidently about the unknown and what is uncertain. And so to be able to knock on the CEO or the CEO's door and say, you know, having the mindset that we have all the answers for the future and for tomorrow is going to get us into trouble. Thinking that we can use the strategy that we've used before tomorrow will get us into trouble. And so we need to be confident and able to respond to crises. We need to be able to be adaptive. And I do think having your research is important. I usually have a little cheat sheet of some facts and figures, strong data, because speaking to that and using their language is really important. But to be able to say, it's important that the, your people can still perform under uncertainties because the human brain's not designed to do that. And so it needs to be trained, it needs to be learned. And, yeah. and being able to speak to that, I think is helpful. I, I, I really love that. Thank you for saying that. It, it, we always have to be reminded what got us here isn't what's gonna get us there, right? <laughs> Even if we're mm -hmm. not. Yeah, we, for our, our brains are trained to forget that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, George is the third colleague. Did you have anything you wanted to offer? No, I mean, Erica answered it and Dr. Roberts answered it very, very perfectly. Um, it's that adaptability that we need and that organizations need to have in order to kind of succeed. So I totally agree with uh, what they have to say. Great. Thank you. A question that came up in chat, could you again define what is the SOPA certification, exactly what it is and what power and skill does it give to the holder of that certification? Yes, I'll be more than happy to do that. And I want to say this, I think we talked about this fence before. For practitioners who are out there, you're not alone. The Institute here is here to help you. We are available to present to your client, your customer, your organization, free of charge. I hope you heard that. Oh, we did. We, we, <laughs> we, we want to make sure that we, we are a knowledge management organization. And I want you to know that once we present the data to the, to the group that you feel they need to hear this, it's a matter of how do you want to proceed, okay? And, yep. and based on how they want to proceed, this goes into Vince's question, the SOPA certification allows you to have all the rigor required to take them through a process of proceeding, which will net solutions that if you're an L&D, you can, you can devise and create L&D interventions from. If you're a change management practitioner, you can devise and create change management interventions or performance improvement interventions, but you drive it, having taking them through a, what I would call a pretty bulletproof process. This process is not, is not a fire hose process. Yeah. It's, it's a very <laughs> gradual effect where all stakeholders are involved and so everyone's in it together. And I think we've been saying that through the pandemic. So hopefully you understand that the ESO, ESO or SOPA certification gives you all the tools that George talked about and more. And we're giving these tools right now to second in command COOs across the country. We're meeting with them. They want this information so that they can have yeah. a much stronger position at the table and responding to what are you gonna do to make sure we're, we're not hit you know, with something that's going to knock us off kilter. Good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Erica Robert, or did George, did you have anything to add? No. Okay, oh, thank you. Have... Vincent, we're, uh, we're, we're uh, rapidly approaching our end point. Um, we have about, uh, well, a couple of minutes left, but I think we should end it. Kathleen. Kathleen. I was just going to do one more. I, I, you know, it's so powerful to have uh, a methodology and have 
tools and the rigor that you're talking about, um, especially, you know, when everybody feels like everything's swirling around them, that gives them something to cling to, which is really uh, so powerful. And I'm, I'm sensing, but I, I wanted to give you guys a chance to just uh, remark on this. Uh, Inherent in the tools and your methodology, does this give the, the um, practitioners L&D performance with the C-suite um, the opportunity to measure business results at the end of the day? It seemed like that to me, but I just wanted to give you a chance to remark on that so that you can measure, yes, we achieved what we wanted to achieve. George, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> I mean, I can say that pretty much, yes, that's what it is. Um, it is. It is a tool where you can bring to bring to the table and be like, this is this is here is how we can pretty much change not change our strategy but prioritize our strategies and yeah. and this is how we can get there. <clears throat> I think, also, yeah, I think I think George, you didn't have time to share the accountability component, which shows the measurable results, either qualitative, yep. Kathleen, or quantitative. So there is an accountability and it's measured on a quarterly basis within any organization, providing a dashboard to the practitioner and the C-suite so they can see departmental improvements quarter over quarter, year over year, based on targeted objectives. Give them yeah. some dashboards. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Powerful stuff, Dr. Roberts. Very powerful. Okay, I want to bring our meeting to a close today. Um, for those of you that have joined us, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month.